So are we ready? Good to go. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'd like you to welcome you all to the regular meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. Thank you all for wearing masks and keeping us all safe. Item one on the agenda is the first selectmen's re remarks, and normally I have a few pages. I have one paragraph tonight, so you're all blessed. As we close 2022, I'll just let you know that I've written a review of our many departments and the services they have provided for all of us over the past calendar year, and also a list of the accomplishments that all of us who live in wonderful Woodbridge have made together. That write-up will be published in the Friday, December 16th edition of the Woodbridge Town News. We may not always agree on the best direction for our town, but I believe we are all sincere in our desire to make Woodbridge the best pos possible version of itself and we remain stronger together. Thank you to all of you on the Board of Selectmen for all your efforts this past year, as well as our many other boards and commissions, and I want to express my gratitude to the residents of Woodbridge who have taken their time to reach out to me by phone, text, or email, or dropping by Town Hall. I have and will continue to listen to your opinions and suggestions. By working together, we can solve problems and enhance the quality of life in our town. As your first selectman, it has been my honor and my privilege to serve this community. I wish you all a happy, safe holiday season and a wonderful 2023. And with that, I will move to item two, which is the Board of Education, Interim Superintendent Christine Syriac, and introduction of Superintendent Vonda Tenska. I hope I said it right. <laughs> Come on up. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm just going to introduce Vonda to all of you. Um, so Christine Syriac, interim superintendent for the second time. This is Vonda Tenza. She is the new superintendent. She began Monday the 12th. Um, <laughs> so she's going to share a little bit more information about herself um, and what we're doing currently in the district with all of you. And I just want to thank you. It's been a pleasure both times to work with all of you. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Christine. Well done. I do want to thank you for the opportunity to consistently be able to come here and keep communication open. Um, you know, your, your school district is a very important part of your town. It's a cherished piece of what we're growing into the future. And I am honored to be your next superintendent. I'm very proud. It's a wonderful community. And I'm just very appreciative of everything that I've already felt in terms of a welcome. So my first day was Monday. I have been transitioning with Christine Syriac since the 30th of November over a variety of days. And I did send out a letter to the community today. So perhaps that will be in your inbox um, and posted on our website for you to view as well. But I come to you um, for the past eight years, I've been in Seymour as the associate superintendent. And prior to that, I was a director of curriculum and technology and an assistant principal in a regional district similar to this over in Hebron. And part of that I taught for 20 years. So I'm, I'm very proud of that experience. It helps me really be grounded in the work of teaching and learning. And I also want to thank Christine Syriac for the investment of kindness and sincerity that she has offered your school community. And she's been a great presence and a role model for all of us. Um, she will continue to be a presence as she will serve as my first year superintendent CAPS coach. So throughout the next year, we will continue to benefit from her guidance and she knows your town you know, quite well. So Christine and the Board of Education have been wonderfully supportive of the transition. And I just wanna let you know that one of the very first things that I've been immersed in is your budget. So we've been working very hard studying it and working on bringing it to a point where we can present it to the Board of Education Monday evening. And Christine, that's really her final task. And I've been very closely aligned with her so that it can be a smoothless transition when I continue that work um, in the new year. So I just wanted to thank you. I also, in brief, I appreciated your gratitude that you offered your community. It's a nice thank message. You. Anyone thank have you. any questions or comments? Welcome to Woodbridge. Thank you. It is a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much. I will acknowledge also our uh, chairman of the Board of Education, Woodbridge Board of Ed, Lynn Piazic is here as well this evening. I don't know for how long. You're welcome to stay the whole night. 
<laughs> I come in support of two um, amazing women, and um, Christine has been just such a wonderful addition um, and has provided such a transition and a bridge during this time of uncertainty and transition for our school district. And um, she is hardworking, she is professional, but she has brought a warmth and caring that we really needed in the school um, in the past seven months, six months, <laughs> whatever. <It> was counting. <laughs> Second time around. <laughs> and um, we are delighted to welcome um, Vonda as well. And um, we are very hopeful in um, her being with us and bringing her wealth of knowledge to, to uh, the community. So thanks so much for um, your support in this time of transition for us. And uh, I know Vonda's looking forward to working with you. Good. So thank you, Beth. Okay, thank you. Anyone have any comments or questions? Anything? Nope, okay, well that, thank you so much. We'll move on to item three. We have with us, uh, well, I'll introduce Sandra Stein, who can introduce everyone else for us. Uh, an update on the Community and Cultural Center. This is a presentation. Sandy is the building committee chair. This is the what used to be the old firehouse and is now uh, someday soon going to be a community and cultural center, which is very exciting due to being funded with a grant from the state. Yes. Yep. Yes. So thank you. All right. The floor is yours, Sandy. Okay, thank you for that nice welcome. You're and welcome. we are really pleased to be able to share with you the schematics for the proposed community and cultural center in the old firehouse mm -hmm. and a conceptual master plan for the outdoor areas that surround the building, including the grove, and all the way around the library. So that's what we will share with you today. Um, I'd like to introduce um, our building committee members. Andrea Weinstein, and actually Bob Tucker, who was um, not able to join us at five, he may come. And then from Silver Petricelli, we have uh, Matt Gellerani, and from Eris Land Studio, Eris Stallis, and um, they will do the major part of the presenting. I wanted to give you a little <coughs> background so you understand where we're coming from. Um, we began meeting in May of this past year, and we solicited program ideas um, for both the indoor and the outdoor spaces from the library, human services, recreation, and the community council. And these program ideas, I basically, I distributed them to you. Um, so you have a copy of that. It's just one page, both sides. Um, that's what was used by our architects and land use design experts to formulate these plans. So we've already had a great deal of input um, from people who we think will use the space, but also it represents what they need in addition to the space they currently have. We believe that the creation of these spaces has the potential to really be transformational for the residents of the town of Woodbridge and for the town staff. If these spaces are really well designed, we're gonna be able to provide multiple venues for town residents to gather for organized events, social gatherings, impromptu get-togethers, to host exhibitions, to attend classes, performances, et cetera, et cetera. And a key design principle for the indoor space in particular is really having flexible use of the space. And that type of design will facilitate multiple uses for the many different types of activities that both residents and um, town employees would like to use the space for. And an important component of that is furniture, lighting, the use of color and design, and that will be key in terms of making the spaces functional um, and usable and inviting. One of the key design principles for the outdoor space is connecting all the different spaces because it's a really a, a pretty large area <clears throat> with accessible smooth walking paths um, that are wheelchair accessible and that have excellent external lighting as well as providing multiple venues for sharing activities <clears throat> outside we presented these schematics to the town department heads on november 16th there were about 25 people in attendance 
we see, received a lot of positive feedback from that presentation and some very good suggestions. So we would now like to present these plans to the Board of Selectmen so that we can get your feedback about the design and the use of the indoor and outdoor space prior to holding an open session with town residents on January 25th. So I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Matt Gilarani uh, from Silver Petrocelli. Hello everybody, my name is Matt Gilarani. I am with Silver Petrocelli and Associates. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with our firm. We do a handful of work here in town. Um, I am the project architect on this job, so I'll be helping the committee working through all of the conceptual, schematic, and all the way through to hopefully get this uh, eventually built and really add to your to your community and your and your town center. Um, I'm actually going to turn this right over here to Eris, um, Eris Land Use, and have him take the wheel here on the conceptual master plan uh, that we've been compiling for the entire uh, town center here. Thank you, Matt. So, first thing we wanted to do is understand what do we have here. Um, so this really is intended to demonstrate um, kind of the, the use patterns, vehicle patterns, and how are people coming in and out of the space. These uh, green lines represent your pedestrian path systems. These blue lines are your major vehicular routes. So we have parking here, here, a little bit here near the police station, as well as here along Meeting House Lane. Um, these yellow lines represent the, uh, the uh, path systems for emergency uh, service vehicles, police, fire, ambulance. We also do realize that there isn't an ambulance that's often parked in this location here. So, you know, this is really the whole green space, but the focus from a mostly functional perspective really occurred in this space, which we call the Grove. Um, we're not doing anything to this open green space here. That's remaining as it is. So we're not going to change that in, in any bit. But there is proposed design of yes. the library. Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll make it. Okay. <laughs> so th this is kind of the, the overall, overall plan. And as, as Sandra mentioned, we are proposing some changes here around the library. This is kind of the major site work associated with the community center. And then later on, I'll talk to you about kind of some changes around here. But first, let's focus right in on the community center here. So one of the things is to create a, a nice drop off here. This, when Matt gets into your building design, this is the front entrance for the building. One of the issues on this building is, well, what's the front? Um, because some may say, well, I'm driving along here. This appears to be the front. This is on the front of the roadway. So we're dealing with a building that has almost four fronts. But architecturally, and with the drop off, we're strengthening the front here. So this becomes your, your, your point of entry here. Um, these patio areas, one is we really want to take advantage of the solar heating that's going to happen here. With On a, a day like today, if it was sunny, it probably would have been 10 to 15 degrees warmer in, the, in this space right here, just with the sun shining on it. So that's the kind of thing I know I enjoy to get out. It's a nice sunny day to just get that vitamin D in me. So. That's, these are designed to be kind of flexible uh, use spaces um, that are adjacent to the building here, maintaining these bays that are there today. We're proposing a, a stone wall to the same, to match the one that's existing here, to start creating a sense of separation between when people are using the space and traffic. You kind of want to have some trees and a wall just to get that sense of security. We do what we are talking about proposing a crosswalk here. The one that's at the fire station currently is primarily used by town staff. It's really not utilized by the public as much, and this seems to make a lot of sense to connect to the trails that are across here. Um, this, this patio area here 
when Matt gets into the uh, interior design, you'll see makes sense in terms of the, the possible cafe that we're talking about having located inside the building. Now when we get into the, the green space here, one of the things is this area here where you see the parking lot, this is about where the existing parking lot is today that serves the, the library. So today you have about 16 spaces there. This expands it to about 29 total um, using diagonal parking and trying to be very efficient. We know when we have the community space, we're going to have to try to figure out what the parking needs are. And I think longer term, part of this overall plan is to provide you a lot of flexibility in terms of how much parking do you need. Because we don't want to overbuild parking, but at the same time, don't want to end up with a, you know, a, a constant headache. So right now, it, it, it works well, but this is just a, a possible solution for additional parking. Uh, this represents a shelter that could be utilized year round, so it would be enclosed, and possibly some have talked about heating, correct? To, mm -hmm. to have heat come down, so it could, that, once you add heating, suddenly it starts becoming available year round. This open space here is intended to be just an open use space for children, the public. It's really not defined. We're not intending a, like a, a, a definitely built playground because we don't see a need for that. So this is kind of like a open activity area. This would be a uh, garden space. It could even be a garden that helps serve some, some of the culinary classes in the building, growing herbs and, and things like that. And just for reference, this is the existing parking lot for the library today. In this area of the Grove, we're looking to reorient some of the, uh, the, the, the bocce ball. Currently, I'm showing two shuffleboard courts. We've heard comments that only one is needed. Uh, we're providing space for a horseshoe area as well. So these are kind of the, the uses that are proposed right now. And part of dealing with the Grove area is really kind of focusing how can we preserve the very mature trees that we want. And some of the trees, like the cherries that have kind of grown through, and maybe we end up losing those. So part of the plan is to preserve as much of the mature trees as possible. In the library area, I think one of the most dynamic spaces is this space right here, which isn't utilized and there's been a memorial beech tree planted. And that beech tree, that'll grow for 400 years. <laughs> so it'll, it, it'll be here long after we're gone. But the idea is that we expand this to be a passive library space. Uh, possibly expanding seating spaces, something like that. It will likely include having to look at the library and how do we strengthen the connections from inside to outside. But this is intended to become a garden passive space here. This space here is intended as a, an amphitheater so that it could either be a small group or a larger group to gather. So it, it's you know, at one point, some crazy person, that's me, said, you could use it for parking, but that's just the wrong place for parking. So this is intended to kind of create that education, learning, theater, outdoor activity space. And one of the things you'll notice here is all these, these walkways that we're adding, which some, for example, this walkway exists today, but it's really intended um, the town does have grants coming for uh, implementing some of these walk systems to eventually go to the high school. But this is, allows you to start thinking, okay, if we're going to have money for the walkways, now we know where we're going to put them and how it relates to any other future building. I'm just going to mention that um, in that, uh, where the beech tree is in the center there, um, there's a desire to have that actually be like a, an outdoor workspace um, so that there be Wi-Fi connections or abilities to charge out there so that it can be a beautiful garden space, but it's also like a, a reading space and a working space outside. 
Now, the other thing we looked at is, you know, where can, if I need parking, where can I get it? And by this little expansion here, and it doesn't even touch the gardens here, we can gain about 13, 14 spaces near the, the police station area um, if you need those spaces. And it's an easy, quick improvement there. The other thing is, how do we kind of slow people around this intersection? Here's Town Hall, where we currently are. And t today, it's a, the arc goes like this, and people just zip by here, because it's the perfect high-speed <laughs> turn. So if you want to see, you know, that's like, you know, when you're 20 years old, and you're seeing how fast you can go around the corner. So this is intended to really calm the traffic and start organizing it in a manner so that um, we're controlling the traffic flow. And it, it literally forces you to almost stop to come around the corner, making for a safer crosswalk here at Town Hall. Now, part of the discussion is, do we make uh, Meeting House Lane one way? And which way do we make it? Right now, there's agreement to maybe make it one way, but we don't know if one, this way or that way is the better one, so that's still up for discussion. But it does, by making it one way, we are able to add about 13 more spaces on Meeting House Lane without adding any more pavement or anything there. So, um, so that's quickly, in a nutshell, the, the site plan improvements. We can wait till the end for questions or let Matt keep going. Does anyone have any thoughts or comments about the outside conceptual plan? I have a quick question while, while we're talking about potentially one way and parking. How does making Meeting House Lane one way get you another 13 spaces? So if, if you go to the overall site plan, so by doing that, one, I can add parallel parking along this side of the roadway. Oh, okay. And then I've added four spaces right up here. So that's that's how that happens. Okay. Thank yeah, you. The, the existing parking over where the uh, charging stations are, here. Uh, uh, that just gets expanded? Is that what that is? That's essentially expanding it. I mean, it's a completely reconfigured, but it's, I... It looks I, like it's in a little bit of a different place. It's, it's, diff it's definitely a, a very different configuration, but we tried to keep the entrance in the same location. Okay. Because I didn't want to add... I, this 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 roadway here, it's just I didn't want to add more entries, so right. it's intended so people come in and out of the same location. Mm -hmm. And if you do need like an ambulance to come here, this is intended. Any emergency service vehicles can drive right up here. So on the still on the topic of parking, yes, uh, were you able to consider something like a solar canopy for parking? We, we de that's that discussion hasn't come up, but we it's definitely possible to be adding that. The one thing I would propose here would be pervious pavement, because then you could do away with any stormwater infrastructure. It's a slightly different system. Um, if you have a canopy, now you've changed those dynamics. I mean that's yeah. The, the, we we see that happening constantly. I mean, town of Fairfield has them. All of yeah, to, uh, at the JCC, there's a yeah. Yeah. great yep. example of that. Yeah. yeah. We'll make a note of that. Too. Yeah. So, to uh, also again with your one-way street, that's going to put pressure on that little jog at New Newton Newton right there, right by the yeah, front they, base. Yeah, that's this. So, because if I can't take a left and I'm trying to get up Newton Road, I'm gonna I'm gonna be right in front there. Yes, right. people will, this will kind of change the dynamics here. It really needs kind of in-depth kind of traffic or, yeah, traffic engineering examination. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this piece right here, we talked about, oh, we'd love to just take this land and, and have this just a simple intersection here. But, but this is, since this is a state road, that kind of stretches that approval process out. But. Yeah, if we make this one way, it's your decision, the town's decision, and then, yeah, that it'll change depending on which way, if we go in this way or out this way, it's going to change. And I think also just, 
your experience of watching it for years, like, no, this will be better because that's ultimately it's your roadways. You drive it every day, so you know right. that we get numbers to back up. So I think the other thing is, Sheila, is that um, we'd like to think about eliminating that cut through. Yeah. It will take many years with you know the Department of Transportation because anytime you have an entry or an exit from a state road, they need to approve it. So that could be in the plans for the future. Right. Um, but that's what would make the most sense. And is it the traffic authority, the committee of the police department that would ultimately, because the board of selectmen can't make decisions about no, streets, no. right? It goes I to go with the department have discussion, right? So that won't necessarily be part of the initial plan, but it is definitely on the table because it's kind of like an added nuisance, um, and it, it would be much better to have that be a contiguous expanded space. Great. And so one of the things about connecting roadways is they're always trying to get it to be like a T yeah. so you can look clearly because no right. I can never look over my shoulder so um, and there, there's not I actually had looked a bit at it trying to make this happen and it's it's kind of difficult but yeah that would all there's a whole lot of design that just mm -hmm. goes into reclaiming this little piece of land here but again it's a master plan so you could say okay we can do a today, B tomorrow, C next year, and so on. So with, with all this additional green space and all of these walkways, have you given any consideration to the additional maintenance that this will require? So your walkways currently around the library are asphalt. Um, Asphalt has a lifespan of typically about 20 years, 30 if you really squeeze it, 40 if you're desperate. Um, you know, the, you know and, and there's different materials we can use for the pathway materials. Concrete's longer lasting, but then it costs much more. So concrete, say $12 a square foot, asphalt's three to four dollars a square foot. So. And then if you could also designate which pathways stay uh, maintained through winter, and then which you just say, let it just snow over, let it go natural. That becomes kind of a question between public works. Mm -hmm. But it will, I mean, ideally some of the ideas that we've talked about is actually trying to promote more of a ecological approach to the green space so instead of, you know, the way you clean up all your leaves every year and take them away, if we do more natural landscaping, the leaves can stay where they are, and it's just kind of part of it. So that's the, another way to look at it. Um, will it be more maintenance if you have more pathways in the garden? Yeah, because now you have to take care of all these walks around this building, which you hadn't in the last, since the new firehouse was built. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Eris. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not getting as much color up here as on the slides, but um, thank you, Eris. So, so yeah, so as Eris kind of talked about this larger conceptual plan for the entire town center, um, I'm going to focus in on the old firehouse here really the gateway to that town center. So as, as Sandra had mentioned previously, one of the biggest things we were tasked with was really creating a flexible and adaptable space that can be used for years and years and years. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple different layouts. Really the only thing that changes between them is the furniture. And the goal of this is to really showcase how these spaces can be used um, in different manners for different activities, ranging from you know smaller kids to, to seniors. Um, so, Let's start off here. As Eris had mentioned, one of the, the major points here was defining where we're gonna enter this building from. So you'll see here, and I have a, a couple renderings um, of the building to show you later, uh, but this would be where our new entryway is, coming off of Eris' uh, new parking lot here. So the front entrance of this building would be at the, uh, on the back side of it from the main road. 
Upon coming into the building, you walk into the existing corridor. So this would all be, this would be, you know, try to minimize the amount of new construction here. It's an old firehouse. We're really trying to pr preserve uh, as much of it as we can, working with SHPO, um, the State Historic Preservation Organization. Um, so we're really trying to preserve as much of the original integrity of it as we can. So as you walk into the entryway here, um, the this set of old bays will become a multi-purpose room. And you notice a lot of the flexibility is going to be achieved through furniture, through some finishes of defining different areas on the floor for, you know, on the floor where people can move soft furniture to or you know, have a small group. One, th you know, one thing we are proposing here is a movable partition, that dash line down the center. So you could actually take this space, you could have a large meeting in here, you could split it up and you could have two smaller groups that can meet in this space simultaneously. As you walk down um, the existing hallway here into the oldest portion of the firehouse, this is the, the old uh, apparatus bays. Again, one of the, in, in this layout, conceptually what we're thinking is that this could potentially become a gallery. Um, so some old firehouse memorabilia, you could have small lectures in here. Uh, some display cases, all while maintaining the integrity of that space. Off to the, the front portion of it here, the, you know, we would be keeping the doors, potentially uh, adding some doors with some more glass in there to allow some transparency and some more natural light to really invigorate that space. But again, a lot of the flexibility will be accomplished through how we deal with the floor finishes, um, some minor ceiling finishes, the lighting, etc. One thing to note in this is, you know, due to the amount of proposed people and occupants that we will have in the building, we will be adding an additional, uh, a new staircase that is to code to be able to safely evacuate people from the building in the case of an emergency. This stair will also be just used as a general communicating stair as well. Uh, as we come back here, we will be placing an elevator in the building. ADA accessibility is obviously of importance, especially with a, a, a range of um, age groups utilizing the facility here. So there will be an elevator added. And as well with our increased occupancy amount, we will be uh, renovating and creating two new toilet room facilities. So two new gang toilet rooms, all again ADA accessible. Um, a really exciting portion of this is down this hallway here and this portion off to the bottom of the building here. From talking with the committee, one, one program, pro, program element is a cafe. And we thought that this could be a really, really exciting space where uh, you know, some people who work from home are trying to get out of the house now and work in other places. So you could potentially work here. You could have a small party in this smaller group room off to the right side. Or you could just come and get a, get a cup of coffee, potentially a small snack, but also that cooking classes could be taught out of the kitchen here. So our goal would be to make this uh, a relatively open kitchen where they could actually have cooking classes and a myriad of different activities in this space. Again, really pushing flexibility and adaptability um, for, for all the residents. As Eris had previously mentioned, off to the side here, um, there would be a new patio created. And we thought, what a way to pay homage to the firehouse. And I know, I believe we, you know, you know, just put windows uh, in here, but to put a, a, a roll-up door back in on this side so that this cafe could actually really have a very nice connection back to the exterior and back to that new, uh, the new park space or the grove um, that we're creating. Off to the right side as well, this new exterior patio, again to allow any of the occupants or users of the building to go and sit outside, uh, really take in the sun and just have a different location to be able to work in. You know, this, this patio bleeds out all the way to the front of the building here. So you could really see this, uh, this building being used in multiple different ways, potentially at the same time or at different times. As we come upstairs, again, there's that new stair. Here's the existing stair. Um, off the, above, this is a portion of the old firehouse as well, would be the potential for some offices, uh, a small conference room. Um, and that space can be used in, in a, a few different ways. Really, we're still kind of working through that. And then off to the right side, above the old apparatus bay, would become a nice open room. Um, I have it marked here as lecture and yoga because, again, pushing flexibility. This could be, all the chairs could be stowed underneath the dormers. 
and you could open this up and have a yoga class up there. You could also hold a, a 50 person lecture up there. Um, so again, really trying to drive forward this community aspect of it, of it being able to be utilized in multiple different uh, fashions. So again, same layout, nothing, nothing has changed other than just some relocation and uh, some different ways to show the furniture. So up at the top here, this could potentially be used as a multi-purpose of fitness room. So you could have stationary equipment uh, if the town desires. You could also have free weights. Uh, but it's just the uh, ability to provide a space that people could come and work out. It doesn't necessarily need to be used as a lecture area or a small group area. And similarly with the exhibition and gallery off to the east portion of the page here, um, this is showing a, a, a classroom setting. So really through furniture, working with um, the design committee with about finishes and different ways to split up these spaces to entice people to, to want to go there, but to be able to separate into smaller groups, um, to not feel uncomfortable in any of the spaces. And I've left the cafe as it is in this because, again, there will be flexibility within the cafe and the adjacent small group room, but that for the most part is going to remain as that cafe space throughout, again, with the kitchen. You can't really move the kitchen um, that easily for flexibility. Um, upstairs in this office space, just showing a conference table just for reference. You know, you can fit 10 people around a conference table here. This could be used as a small personal office for one of the departments. Um, but again, this, this space was too small to really to blow it wide open um, and utilize as a, a small classroom or anything of that manner. So this would be a small office and a conference room. Off to the right, just showcasing again more of that lecture style uh, or potentially a classroom. So again, really what I'm trying to, to, to showcase to all of you is the adaptability of these spaces uh, and how we're going to be able to create a, a community and cultural center that isn't single use for each room, that, that we can really have a myriad of activities in here, myriad of age groups, um, and it can, really, it can be enjoyed by all the residents of the town. Um, and again, another separate layout showing some different furniture um, organization here, up to the top just some smaller groups, and off to the right, a potential for more loose, soft furniture, um, you know, small, small groups to meet and, and talk in the round. There you go, again, the small office with the conference room and the yoga mats um, all laid out there on the floor. So just want to transition into this. So, um, so we, we approach this and it may, you know, one of the things with historic buildings is they, they Shippo um, really likes any addition to, to be different than the original building because they want the original building to, to be a piece of its own and they want, they want uh, you know, people to be able to see that this has been added on. So the approach here would be to provide a new canopy, um, utilizing some of the materiality that is already on the existing roofs, uh, metal panel, um, something of that sort, but to really to start to pull people in from that grove space. Um, the wall extends beyond in order to hide some dumpsters, uh, some gas meters, and some other utilities off to the rear there, but again to shield it from this side from the main road. Um, and that red column just again an homage back to its original use as a firehouse. Just another view from, from the parking lot here, but again really trying to, to show that this addition will have a different vernacular um, than the original firehouse so that you can respect and appreciate the original firehouse for, for the beautiful building that it is. And this is just a, a couple of two slides here just showcasing some imagery. Um, from some projects that we have done in the past, um, how to, you know, these, these spaces and being able to reuse, these are all, uh, were all reused older buildings um, that we preserved and transformed into some smaller lecture spaces as you see in the top right and left. Um, and the bottom left here is a, is a cafe that we've recently designed in, up in Kent. Um, and again, so we won't have a, a fireplace in your cafe, but again, that openness, uh, some warm materiality to really to, to create an exciting space. Um, photo in the top left is pretty symbolic of what the upper floor of the old apparatus bay could become. Um, again, a warm space, a lecture hall, some place for people to do yoga and exercises, and then just some more generic imagery of what the spaces could 
look like with the doors open in the bottom left. So again, creating this great connection to the exterior in the warmer months, but still allowing a lot of natural light um, and warmth in uh, during the winter months. And as well on the right, just some ceil different ceiling treatments, how we may approach some of these, uh, some of these spaces, and just a generic conference room uh, as to what you might see typical on the upper floor of, of your building. That wraps it up for me. I'd love to field some questions or comments. Anyone from the board have any comments or questions? Uh, the space that you have designated as a fitness area, yes, what, what the, the space that you have designated as a fitness area, uh, what are the dimensions of that space and how do they compare to the fitness area space we already have? Dimension, the, sp the space is roughly, so it's about 32 foot wide by roughly 45 feet um, long, up, up to up top to bottom there. Mm -hmm. So you get about a thousand. I think you have about yeah, a thousand seventy square foot of of space in that that multi-purpose uh, mm -hmm. facility up there. That room. Do you know what we have now at the fitness center? I unfortunately am not aware of what the current uh, fitness center. Do you, I don't. Do you I don't know, recall. Yeah, I, I do not know offhand, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I could probably find that, find that and have a comparison you for you, but I don't. Andrew, no. no I <laughs> We have, do we have two spaces or just one? We have two, you have two spaces yeah. here. Yeah. And, and, either side of that hallway or and they're right. packed. Yeah. Right. I don't think that the goal is necessarily to replace what we have. It's to uh -huh. really look at what are the appropriate functions that we want to see in this community and cultural center. And um, I don't think that it's the notion, except we will actually get some feedback from town residents. Um, as to what are the types of functions they would like to see. Um, and um, is, it, is the fitness center appropriate for this or are there other functions that are more important to town residents? So that hasn't been decided yet. I see. Okay. Can I just add something? Sure. That um, when we had the meeting with the various directors of the departments, mm -hmm. John, John Adamovich was at that meeting um, and if we do use that as a fitness center, which, which is a, a hope of the recreation department, that um, that that bay would could work as a fitness center. It might not be as large. There might be selected um, equipment, but he felt that that could work as a fitness center. Okay. But getting the correct size would it's a good, it's a good thing to get. We should have. I missed that last part. What was that? Getting, um, having the correct dimensions of the current fitness center would be, yes. would be important to also have to see what that configuration would look like. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Can I also ask a question about that bay? You showed some photos with fitness center equipment and a, like a bay door open. Mm -hmm. is, is that wing got those bay doors or? The bay doors would remain. Okay. on there we've we've talked about and again we're in you know this conceptual schematic design phase we've talked about a couple of different options do those doors remain and they potentially become um, have some more glass in them the one thing we are up against is shippo um, shippo is very you know strict on a lot of their requirements for these historic facilities and buildings so try to do the best we can to, to modernize by adding glazing and some different components like that um, another suggestion was actually that we create two larger bay windows there, that mm -hmm. those don't actually become, they're not actual functional bay doors, but that there's some larger storefront style windows. As the pavement, the asphalt that is in front of those doors will go away with Eris's plan. It would become, it would become grass. Mm -hmm. um, so the functionality of the doors would not be there anymore. So there's a potential to make them just static glass. And also part of the reason why we wanted to take the pavement away is that's the north side of the building. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be in shade, and it's just always going to be a much cooler space. So that's why we kind of, and we didn't want paving around the entire building. Right. Um, Matt, you, you mentioned, Matt, the, uh, the, pot, the functional use of as meeting rooms where, uh, could you tell me again how many people you expect to be the capacity of these when they were used as a meeting room? Sure, so 
roughly from the layout that I have up as a multi um, multi purpose room at the top there, if that space was divided, it's one, two, three. looks like probably about 12 people in the round on the right, mm -hmm. and each one of those tables I believe has eight chairs at it. So, you know, you're talking about 24 people in the smaller room right. on the on the left side here. Yeah. Um, in the you know this lecture room upstairs shows about 49 chairs. Okay. And these are all within code conformance as well. And that's another thing that we've been studying greatly with this is how do you create a building that has, let's say, eight different uses and, and, and where do you fit it into the code? And you know, how do you make sure that everybody can evacuate and occupy the building safely? Um, so yeah, so roughly, I'd say roughly about 50 people um, in each of these spaces, give or take, would be for a, for a lecture or for a, um, a larger meeting. Well, maybe you, Matt, or Sandra would know how that fits into what our capacity is in other buildings for meetings. You know, does that fit in like, oh, it's the same, or is it occupy sort of a big, bigger space? Or? So this is a little bigger space. Yeah. Um, the library community room um, handles about 40 chairs comfortably. Um, so this would be bigger than that. And I think that in the um, original bay for the firehouse, you could fit um, probably up to 75 people hmm. in there. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, e each of the bays is slightly different. So it does really expand our capacity, and that's what gives us the flexibility to hold events that we can't really do right now. And then a, the final thought or question that I had was, uh, your experience with some of these multi-purpose spaces in other buildings? So our... Do, do they always may stay as multi-purpose, or do they tend to, over time, just become one thing? So, in my opinion, that's really on the onus of the of the users of the of the of the building. If it's, I think, looked at as a as a building that has these multiple functionalities and it continues to be used as that, I don't see why it couldn't maintain on that on that. Well, I was path, just wondering on that path. in a practical matter. Have you right. designed them and seen what happens? I, I don't know what Yeah, they, they typically do stay as meeting spaces, especially, you know, the rooms that are designed with like a foldable partition or something of that sort, they'll use them as the two smaller rooms or a larger or a larger room. Right. But yeah, in our in my experience, um, you know, our firm's done a, a handful of these community yeah. type centers and those those rooms usually do maintain uh, maintain their purpose. Um, I was just, you know, I was just curious because you know people tend to think, oh yeah, we can be really flexible, but it seems like a lot of times they gravitate toward inflexible or just one. Thing. So I think one of the factors here is that if the building is just a building, I could see exactly what you're saying, mm -hmm. and that people will just get used to the spaces for this purpose, that spaces for that purpose. Um, I think we feel that there needs to be an individual okay, who basically oversees all the activities and coordinates with the library, with human services, uh, with recreation in terms of all the different types of activities that we want to see happen, when they're going to happen. We don't want to have 400 people in that building at one time. You have to have people schedule it. But we'd love to be able to have, you know, a couple families come in and have a little birthday party somewhere. So I, I think that if you have someone who's in charge of this, um, who markets the flexibility of the building and what it can be used for. That's the way it maintains its flexibility. So uh, years ago, there was a problem with this building, uh, which was one of the motivations for building a new firehouse, in that the, the walls seemed to be coming apart, and they were stabilized. Um, can you tell us what's going on with that issue? Is that an issue in the past? It doesn't doesn't affect this, uh, these uh, plans? It's, it's Bay 1, I think, and it had a, doesn't it have a bar in there to hold it? Is that mm -hmm. what you're referring That's to? One, yeah. yeah, I believe there's a, there's a handful of yeah, steel steel bars that were put in to right. fortify and, and hold the walls in. I would assume that whoever the structural engineer was that did that and, and helped along with that, that yes, the building is, is sound. Naturally, because we are um, adding a new stair and an elevator, we will have a structural engineer that will be helping us to analyze a couple of these different components of, of the building. Um, but as of my knowledge now, the building is, is you know, safe and 
again, we'll have our structural engineer consultant on board to, to analyze all the different components. Because I, I don't know that these spaces were used for anything in the past. And now you're, you're putting, you know, 40 people in there. Correct. And that's, you know, as we're going through this process, mm -hmm. we talked about, okay, you know, does, uh, can a, should a fitness space really be on the second floor of the old yeah. firehouse? No. Good question. Mm, <laughs> no. Prob, prob, you know, probably not with heavy weights and stuff. But for yoga, yes, mm -hmm. that can right. potentially work. So I think within the limitations, um, you know, we're going to properly kind of associate spaces with, with, you know, with the different rooms of the building or associate uses with the different groups. Thank you. I had a question about, uh, maybe you can tell us if, if you've considered green energy or uh, other renewable energy sources that you might be able to take advantage of with this building? Sure, so one thing I want to comment on is simply the reuse of a building is yeah. a highly sustainable act for for kind of any, any town, right? Yeah. We're, we're taking mm -hmm. a building that is being underutilized right at the heart of your town center and really repurposing it and you know giving it a breath of new life. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, you know, finishes, yes, there'll be you know, there'll be sustainable finishes, low VOC, et cetera. We our firm strives for that across you know any any building type. Um, I could see a potential for for solar and some other components, but again, mm -hmm. with this building we have to continue it's ship out. And right. really, mm -hmm. what they would allow, for instance, for solar panels being put on on the building, mm -hmm. they they really get into that in the aesthetic of the of the historic of the historic bays and the historic part of the building. So that would end up being a decision on their part. But you know, other than that, we'll be using efficient systems, heating and cooling. Obviously, any new glazing or anything that we replace would mm -hmm. be efficient glazing to really help with annual energy costs, et cetera. So is it all electric? Uh, heating and cooling? What are you, what are you doing there? Well, right? there's a gas Heat service pump? going yes. to it right now, so it would be it would be gas. Which it is, would be gas. Yes, which is efficient, and obviously LED fixtures, etc. Right. You know, low low water toilets. So we kind of. Have you considered not using gas though, and potentially doing a heat pump? Um, we haven't got to that point, so okay. those considerations will start to take hold as we progress past uh, past these more conceptual uh, stages of design. Yeah, certainly long-term uh, energy use and what it will cost the town to, to run the building is, you know, top of mind. And we have sort of a broad, in our strategic plan as the Board of Selectmen, we've talked about trying to do sustainable building and green energy sure. to the greatest extent mm -hmm. possible. Okay. Gas is better than oil, but electric is better than that. Mm -hmm. Sure, of course. And, and our firm strives, again, to, to take all of that into consideration with, right. our, with a multitude of projects. So. All right. right. So, can I ask one more question about the cost? Because this looks beautiful, right? Absolutely beautiful. So, our our plans are, and we do really appreciate your input and suggestions and your questions, is to take these plans to the town residents and have a public presentation um, on Wednesday, January twenty fifth at seven p.m. in the library community room, so we can get some feedback from that. And then what we will do is relook at the plans, given all of the input that we've received. And um, we will come back to the Board of Selectment in February with um, a proposed design and construction costs. So we don't have those right now. Um, I mean, the project is being funded um, through the, um, the state grant that was given. It was $2 million. Um, and we are going to try our best to stay within that. Mm -hmm. um, because we're not going to look to the town to provide more funds. Now, that's just for the building. Mm -hmm. That is not for the outside space. And um, we were hoping that we will have some may maybe estimates of what certain components of the outside work would be and that we might be able to tap into some of the ARPA funds that were given to the town. Because I think making this whole thing work together is really important. Um, because that's what will really make it transformational, both the indoor and the outdoor spaces. So I imagine you potentially thought of, like, this is this would be the full-blown if you could afford to do all of it. Yes. But there's ways to scale it back and say perhaps that this bay or that bay would have the lower cost option? Or no, I, I, I think that... Um, you think you're fitting in the $2 million. 
for right. what you want to do inside the building. Inside. That is, okay. that is the goal. Yeah. Yes. The, the goal is that the building gets right. fully gets fully developed. Uh -huh. Eris's conceptual master plan um, is going to, you know, that could be a little bit more piecemeal, for instance, as he had mentioned. Right. You kind of say, oh, let's do this component, and we have money. Let's do this component. Let's do another one. And that could happen over time. But the, the so goal that could be phased. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yes. The goal of the building is to, to, to come else. within the budget. Uh, obviously, we'll you know work with the committee and everybody to, you know, if needed, create the E options. As everybody knows, it's quite a volatile building market right now. So, um, you know, we, we've been experiencing that for over the past two years and taking that all into consideration. So, as Sandra mentioned, as we get into next steps and estimating and whatnot, those will all be all be on the board. Okay. Yeah. So we'll we'll hear back in February. Is that? That sounds. I would say that sounds about right after the after the public uh, the public meeting. Yeah. So we're probably around February, Sandra, for to revisit them. Yes, we're going to come back to your February meeting with construction costs and schematics. Great. Okay. So right. I think uh, just personally for your public meeting. Yes. My two cents worth. I I find the how it fits into the fabric of what's available. Like that, these meeting rooms are a little, are bigger or more functional. Okay, is uh, is is a good point to bring up with the public because Absolutely. a lot of them are like me, a little bit ignorant of what spaces we do currently yes. do have and yes. what are our limitations now. So, okay. just my thought. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. <clears throat> That's a great suggestion. Okay. Anyone else? Any comments? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Matt great and Eris, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Really, really are. Thank, Thank, you. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Guys. Thanks. We appreciate all the time you gave us. <laughs> so it is now 5.56. Um, the strategic plan, how many minutes do you need? It's would you like it to be four minutes? Yeah, that would be great. I will have public four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Okay, so, so um, uh, David Vogel and I have been hard at work on the strategic okay. plan. We've been meeting with uh, Tony Genovese mainly as our our one and only staff person who's coming to our meetings, which has been very, very helpful. We wanted to put it back on the agenda just so that you're aware it's in your packet again. This is the same document that was shared uh, at the joint board of Selectman Board of Finance meeting. We've added a column to it, which now contains notes about roughly where we are in the process. We wanted to highlight for you um, these tactics that are highlighted in the agenda have to do with um, the sense that the, the money that we were looking at from the federal uh, COVID-related grants were going to be put towards the placemaking in the business district, uh, developing the new Main Street, uh, and then utilizing the, the regular budget process to make some decisions about uh, where we might be spending that fund. So whether we, we direct the bulk of the money to the business district improvements and then perhaps retain some of it to direct towards this project that we just heard about. Um, the, the sense was at the strategic planning committee that, that our regular budgeting process is the best way to get information to the public, get feedback from the public, make some decisions, and then stay on track to uh, have a plan in place for that. Was there more we were going to highlight, David? I'm uh, no, I mean, the, the, there, we, the discussion about the quality of life issue with the uh, with what you know, what we're what we're looking at in terms of streamlining or making the commissions and boards function better was was another strategic thought and uh, how we go about that. So that yeah. further discussion later. Um, and as we heard from the diversity, equity, inclusion committee, I think it was our last meeting, or maybe it was the one before that. Um, the survey that they had taken that uh, people were expressing, you know. Uh, ways in which we might make the town more welcoming to all residents um, and that would include things like affordable housing and, and an ability to uh, you know welcome everyone make them feel like they're part of our community that's in that same uh, quality of life piece of the plan the one other thing that I was meant to highlight was uh, obviously we have several building projects we're just hearing about one uh, just now but the Beecher Building Committee um, because the Board of Selectmen has asked us to also look at the pool, at our last Beecher Building Committee meeting, which was, you know, it's referenced here in our strategic plan, 
Um, we're at the stage where we're going to go out for, we're preparing to go out for an RFP. And we basically have two options for the pool that we want to make sure we get professional services to help us with. So one is making the, that very extensive list of repairs, but the other is potentially repurposing that space. But we have absolutely no idea how that might be done, so we need to get some expert guidance. So that is meant to be part of our RFP process. And as you can see in the strategic plan, we have several RFPs, several building committees happening here. So uh, all of that is the work of the Board of Selectmen to keep track of. So that's the report from the Strategic Planning Committee. Well, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Your if reference. anyone has any questions, please feel free to shoot them to so, us. So Sheila, on, on goal two, maintain and invest infrastructure, the first thing you have under the future of the country club of Woodbridge is to engage the services of a planning consultant with expertise in repurposing golf courses. Now we, we voted, I think it was the August meeting to do that and that has not happened yet. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, and I want to say also it was the, because I looked back, it was December of last year that the uh, Board of Selectmen first began talking about having a planning consultant in there. And yes, that is, that's why we see it here in the strategic plan. It's just based on what we've already discussed as a Board of Selectmen. So partly you're seeing in the plan itself, the reason we've uh, added the column for an update a, a lot of times you're seeing that we're, uh, we're s there are staffing issues, right? So I think that there needs to be a, a greater emphasis on this. I know later in our agenda we're going to be talking about some staffing issues, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to make progress. But this is the plan we all discussed. So right. this this is still the plan. Right, because we unanimously we unanimously voted on that issue. Yeah, we approved that. Thank you. It is now a little 6.01 and it's time for public comment. Um, what? You want to speak in public comment? Give me one second. <laughs> okay, I would ask everyone to state your name and address, please, for the record and limited to three minutes each because we don't have a timer going because we have a big agenda to get to tonight. So I appreciate that. So feel free to come up, state your name and address again, and have a say. And we do not respond to the public comments. We just listen. Of course. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrea Weinstein, 11 Cross Hollow Road. Um, I would just like to make a comment as a citizen and the chair of the Recreation Commission. Um, I'm through the Recreation Department. We are still hopeful that the pool can be up and running. Um, I would just like to state publicly that it is a town gem, as many gems we have in this town. Uh, we understand that there's a large cost um, to expect with getting the pool up and running. But for starters, I know there are desires on that area and there's lots of demands of that area. Um, we would strongly support the idea of purchasing the filters, getting that pool up and running, which could last another two or three years. Uh, the rec department, I know, um, um, John had spoken with, with Tony that the rec department could uh, put in at least $17,000 towards the expense, which was around $50,000 to deal with the filters. And rather than this, this gem sort of laying dormant for as long as it'll take to determine what's to happen in the future, it could be used from our youngest to our oldest citizens for their young swimmers to learn how to swim. And um, it would really be nice to, to utilize it until there's a final decision and plan rather than just laying dormant. So I just wanted to state that and hope you'll consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, my name is Paul Harrigan. I live at Brook Road in Woodbridge. Um, I'm, I've come to speak about uh, the discussion around developing an RFP for the Country Club property. And um, I wanted to remind the Board of Selectmen that they had uh, pledged um, when the last development, uh, when the last developer withdrew their, with, withdrew their proposal, the Board of Selectmen had pledged to hire a land consultant uh, and I think that process makes a lot more sense than to, ju to jump into another RFP. So we're not being reactive. We can be thoughtful in terms of what our next steps are with the property. 
and I would encourage you to uh, continue on the path that you had talked about uh, last year, and that was hiring a land consultant before we do anything else. Um, and I'd also like to make the point that uh, re uh, development of the property has failed five times now. Maybe my count is off and it's six times, but at some point I think you have to recognize the will of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Morella, 184 Rimmon Road. Um, I'm actually calling, coming to discuss um, the newly constituted ad hoc housing committee. Um, I recently learned that you created this committee three months ago. And frankly, I was disappointed, Beth, that you didn't bother to mention this um, in your one of your many articles uh, that you and other means of communications with the public. And now that I do know that there is this reconstituted ad hoc housing committee, I've come to respectfully request that you direct that new committee to hold a long delayed public forum on the town's affordable housing plan. In 2021, when the Board of Selectmen created an ad hoc committee to prepare that plan as required by state statute, Woodbridge residents were promised a public hearing to comment on the plan while it was in draft form. Then in May of this year, our town leadership reneged on that promise and submitted the plan as final without benefit of public discussion. Now you have created a new committee to implement the plan, even though residents have never been given the promised opportunity to review and comment on the draft. So before the new housing committee does anything else, you ought to make some reparation for ignoring the public in the spring and direct the committee to conduct a robust public vetting of this affordable housing plan. Further, you ought to make clear your willingness to modify the plan in light of public input. Please make clear to the committee's members that they should start the new year by scheduling an opportunity for meaningful public input on the plan and then recommend modifications to the plan as appropriate following that public comment. If you fail to do so, you will merely confirm that public comment means nothing to this leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Wick, 181 Rimmon Road. Um, I'm here tonight to reassert uh, and restate my support for protecting and preserving the land at the former Country Club of Woodbridge. I know you're gonna be discussing a potential RFP for that property at the end of this meeting, uh, as well as um, the OCA lawsuit that has unfortunately somehow gotten intertwined with the fate of the property. Uh, this is a position that I and many others in town uh, this position uh, in support of protecting and preserving the land, a position that we've held consistently for over a decade, well before any discussion of affordable housing was on the table. Some town officials seem to view this as an either or proposition. We can either preserve our natural resources or we can increase housing opportunity. This should not be an either or, it should be a both and. Woodbridge can, Woodbridge has and Woodbridge should continue to increase housing opportunity without sacrificing open space. This position is in full alignment with state policy that favors smart development in commercial centers and transit corridors and favors the state's green plan that requires the protection of as much open space as possible, particularly large tracts that are vanishingly rare in Connecticut. I'm sure you all are, saw this cover story in the register last year, or earlier this year rather, uh, a Sunday paper, enough open space, not even close is the headline. And it details uh, how far behind the state is in achieving the goals of the Green Plan. <clears throat> the OCA lawsuit and the inflammatory rhetoric employed in the media seems to have convinced some Woodbridge residents that our town is exclusionary and unwelcoming and that we should be ashamed of our town. Uh, I forcefully disagree with that misleading framing of the issue, and I urge all of you to do the same 
as you defend the town in the OCA lawsuit. I'd like to point out two areas that may surprise some people who have accepted the OCA's mischaracterization of our town. First of all, when I listened to the OCA and they said that you know, Woodbridge is, is so expensive and exclusionary, that didn't square with what I thought I knew about the town. Uh, it turns out Woodbridge housing is actually quite diverse. According to the tax assessor's database, there are more than 300 homes appraised at $250,000 or less in Woodbridge. That's well within the definition of affordable. Uh, now, these are not all classified as legally affordable homes because they're not enrolled in a government program, but they're what's considered naturally affordable homes. And they're not just clustered in one area. They're actually in every neighborhood on almost, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Time to wrap up, but okay. okay. Please. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so these, are, these naturally affordable homes are not clustered in, in one neighborhood or two neighborhoods. They're actually in every neighborhood on almost every street. So they are thoroughly integrated into the town. Um, in addition, Woodbridge is much more diverse uh, racially than I realized. The Connecticut Mirror had a recent article describing a diversity index which was created based on the 2020 census data. And the Connecticut Data Collaborative looked closely at this census data from every town in the state and uh, ranked the towns on their diver racial diversity. Woodbridge ranked very high. Of Connecticut's 169 towns, only 33 were ranked more diverse than Woodbridge. Woodbridge showed a very large increase in diversity since 2010, the previous census, a 17% increase. And Woodbridge turns out to be the most diverse of Connecticut's small towns. So don't let the OCA get away with their inaccurate accusations and fight back with the facts because the facts are in our favor. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Hi. Good evening, everybody. My name is Andrea Urbano, coming to you from 115 Sperry Road in this beautiful town we call Woodbridge. I would like to make clear my consistent um, long withstanding opposition for the development of the Woodbridge Country Club, former Country Club of Woodbridge, and uh, in express my full support for its protection from development. This aligns with the taxpayer's perspective that has been time and time again conveyed to our municipal leadership, spanning well over a decade at this point. It's getting tiring, to be honest, to keep coming back to the same issue. I empathize for all of you to have to deal with this as well. I'm disappointed dis and discouraged by our town leadership. As of recent, you have been fostering a perception of distrust in doing work behind closed doors and ignoring what your constituents have been trying to convey for all these years and months. We as a town are capable of pursuing more than one goal at once. This is why you are in the chairs you are in, to come up with creative problem solving um, led by the interests and needs of the public. We can increase our housing diversity and protect our open space. Land is one thing we cannot get more of. This particular land has immense ecological value, especially being surrounded by densely populated areas abutting New Haven. It has prime and uh, agricultural soils, soils of statewide importance. These are placed through deep as high value conservation areas and in the context 
of all of the climate smart initiatives coming from the feder federal government down to the state level that is intended to trickle out to the municipal level and private landowner sector, um, there is no reason not to be considering the protection of open space in our approach um, to, our com uh, to our complex problem solving here. I uh, am a public servant myself, and I've committed my life to not only uh, protect our valuable natural resources, but to serve uh, the people and to do my uh, part in being an informed resident of Woodbridge, nearly lifelong. Please don't take away the charm that brings people to Woodbridge. I support all the previous public statements and I realize I've gone over my time. Thank you for yours. Thank you. Hi, Adrienne Michi Smith, 17 and Sonia Road. I'll be very brief. As you all know, I support all the comments by the pre previous speakers. We have to protect this place. There is so much, there's just so much there. And um, one thing that I just want to mention is there's a tremendous amount of, um, of um, what do you call it? Milkweed. Thank you. <laughs> of milkweed, tremendous amount of milkweed, which is very important for monarch butterflies. And there are uh, uh, lots of other things there as well, because I walk over there all the time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. I'm Sharon Decat, 94 Center Road, and I want to reiterate what everyone else has said. Land is a resource that is incredibly valuable, and as we forget that, we, we're harming ourselves and our entire community, and it's to our own peril. And I agree that we needed affordable housing, and I'm supportive of that, but really, look at what the priority is. Look how much land has been destroyed in the past decade. We can't keep it up. This is a very rare piece. And housing can be anywhere else. So please, you've put so much time and energy in trying to do this. Hundreds and hundreds of hours. It's failed. People don't want it. Why don't you understand that? We don't want it as a community. There may be some people that think there's economic benefit. It has been proven that in the long term, it will not be economically beneficial. So please listen to that and listen to us. It's not necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Barbara Fabiani, 20 Dillon Road. Um, I support keeping the Country Club of Woodbridge uh, as open space. I, I see no reason to develop it. If you're going to, if we need uh, housing opportunities for individuals, that housing should be located where there are services. And, and also, funny that this meeting would be scheduled at such a busy time of year. All right, so those are my three points. Thanks very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you all. Next, next item on the agenda is an ordinance committee report, and I'll call on Chairman of the Ordinance Committee, Sheila McGrevin, to <coughs> take us through. Oh, I'm sorry. This, this was announced as a uh, hybrid meeting, right? Yes. At some point. Have we asked if there are any people who had public comment on online? I, am, know I apologize. I did. I did not ask, but I was informed by Jerry Shaw this afternoon at 3:30 there were no other comments that were okay. sent in. Thank That's you. All I Good wanted. reminder. I'm just asking. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I will just say that there's no one online to speak. Uh, there's one guest online, but he has not identified or raised his hand to speak, and there were no emails received by. 3.30 this afternoon. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> the owl speaks. <laughs> okay, great. great. All right, thanks. With that, we'll go back to item six, ordinance committee. 
Okay. Uh, so at our last ordinance committee meeting, we sent forward two items for the Board of Selectmen's consideration uh, to see if we want to schedule a public hearing. One is the establishment of a new ordinance uh, regarding the refund of excess payments and authorize the tax collector to retain payments in excess of the amount due, provided that that excess payment amount is less than $25. So this would prevent uh, checks under $25 from going out. That's going to save a lot of time, effort, and uh, cost, expense. And then the second item is uh, our Wibridge Code happens to have a clause in it. it our ordinance has a clause in it that uh, speaks to the membership in terms of office of appointed officials. The Board of Selectmen's already acted on the terms of elected officials, but in order to match those up, uh, we could simply make a very quick change to the wording of the ordinance so that appointed members go to December 31st and the new members would start the, in the even numbered years on January 1st. So that's a very small text correction there. And the thought of the um, ordinance committee was that we could schedule one public hearing and hear both of those items if it were the pleasure of the Board of Selectmen to do that. Okay. That's your report. Thank you. So as I understand it, um, this the next steps are to schedule a public hearing. Schedule, Is that pick, correct? Pick a date and schedule a public hearing for both of those. And normally we do them at the Board of Selectmen meeting. So uh, we need to advertise it in advance. And I don't right. know if uh, the January meeting would meet that advertising uh, time frame. It's January 11th. So Jerry would know. So Jerry Shaw question. Jerry, do you know? Yes, it will meet it. Uh, the public hearing has to be advertised in a paper with general circulation. It's really 11 days prior to oh. the meeting, to the hearing. Okay, that answers that question. Thank you. So, so, so Sheila, um, yes. so anything under $25 would not be refunded, but would it be credited for the yeah, rest it stays of the as Correct, it stays as it a credit. Would, okay. Correct. Be a pretty good thing if we kept it, huh? <laughs> it's very small dollar amounts. Yeah. I don't think that's legal, though. I don't think that's legal. Keeping it. Keep it? Right. Keep it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, and that's actually a good point. Should that be in the text that gets... So what will happen is when we advertise for the public hearing, we need to disclose the text that we're thinking mm. of inserting into this. We can put some, some language in there. Anything under $25 will be credited to the taxpayer's account. That's good. Idea. That is a good idea. Great. All right. Totally fair. So I guess I will make a motion that we schedule the public hearing for January 11th at 7 p.m. or 6 p.m.? What time do we normally do them, Jerry? No. I'm sorry, either 7 or 7.30. Okay, so I recommend 7. Okay, is that okay with everyone? Okay, and that's to be... Uh, that's or you could do it at 6.30. Our meetings are usually not that long. Yeah, actually, I think 6.30 is a good idea. Okay. So that's my motion. Right after public comment. Okay, good. And that is, uh, I would add to the motion um, to receive comments on the ordinances. Right, public should hearing to yep. receive comments. Okay. Yep. If you'll accept that friendly. It should be Certain. short. Yeah. yeah. It's a no-brainer. I know, but sometimes but you never know. <laughs> it costs yeah. you more money to Absolutely. write a small check than the, than, the, than the person who dumb, made dumb, the mistake dumb. receives exactly. in return. Couldn't agree so more. It's, you never know. Yeah. Okay, so with that, we have a motion. I will second it. And any discussion further on this? I'll call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you very much. It's unanimous. Item seven on the agenda is, did I skip something? I always do that, too. Administrative Officer, Director of Finance Report, Mr. Genovese. Thank you. I have uh, your report uh, through November of 20, uh, this past uh, November. And uh, it's a... Um, $346,000 surplus, which is slightly below our allocation from fund balance, which means that um, if it was the end of the year, we would have a slight decrease in our fund balance. And uh, right now, uh, that would be projected at 14% of our annual expenses. Um, and uh, uh, some um, highlights for you. Uh, the first is interest income, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. Uh, we have a surplus of $240,000 there anticipated. Uh, there's a, um, another increase, a rate increase today, so. Um, another half a point. Half a point, right. Yep. So uh, that will half probably percent. continue as a trend. Yep. 
the second is uh, intergovernmental revenue. It's about uh, even. Uh, we had um, uh, received uh, an additional $180,000 from the Connecticut Municipal Revenue Sharing Account, which we have very rarely, I don't think we've received much at all from that in the past. It's basically uh, an account that diverts a portion of sales tax revenues to municipalities based on a formula and a, a need level and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so anyway, we received some of that, which we did not anticipate <coughs> in the budget process. However, uh, we do anticipate a shortfall in the special education excess cost grant. The way we usually work that is, and that's about 190,000, maybe a little less. Uh, the way that works typically is the uh, Board of Education will um, estimate for us in the budget process what they anticipate um, we would receive in the following year. And uh, that came way short of, uh, it's coming way short of what we're actually going to receive. Tony, can yes. I ask a question? Does that uh, sales tax revenue sharing uh, in any way relate to business activity? No, I believe it's, it's just, no. or I it's think just, it's just random. formula, a random formula. Formula, yeah. So irrespective. Okay, right, thank right, you. Yeah. I just wanted to it's good, clarify. It's a good thought, though. <laughs> um, and finally, the town has received $23,000 in opioid settlement funds. I don't know if you've ever seen any of that on the... Wow. Um, a lot of paperwork for, that, <laughs> for Tony. There's uh, two different settlements. <laughs> One is uh, Johnson & Johnson, and the other is um, it's another settlement. Uh, I don't remember who the p defendant was. But the Johnson & Johnson one was most of it. That's about 15000 of it. So, okay. I'll just share that. On our expenditures, um, I, haven't, and I haven't done anything with this yet, but as you know, we locked into a rather, um, a little higher of a natural gas rate. And so we'll have to see how that um, plays out in the coming months. I just want to make sure you're, you're aware of that. Um, the fire chief will be uh, putting together his, uh, a, um, uh, request for funds for his apparatus repairs, which he had mentioned at your last meeting. And um, so we'll wait, await that. Um, in waste management, this is interesting, always an interesting topic to follow. Um, there is a, we're basically projecting a pro possible uh, deficit for two reasons. The first is um, our solid waste tonnage has increased. Uh, based on what we had anticipated in the budget process. Now, the good news there is we charge a fee for that. So hopefully we'll be able to um, recognize some fee revenue on that and have some offset to this deficit. Uh, secondly, a more, more um, costly item is the recycling costs have also increased significantly. So uh, we basically, um, there's a flat, there's like a, f basically a cost, a floor it's called which is how much it costs to process recyclables at the plant. And then that change is based on the market rate for different recycled materials. So um, for instance, um, and the floor is about $70 a ton. It's a little more. So uh, in July, we were paying $37 a ton for recyclables because we were receiving um, quite a bit on um, aluminum is, of course, the one that receives the most money. Uh, but um, paper, and um, I think I think it's paper is, a, is one that was um, was doing well, mm -hmm. in some plastics, and now some of the markets have changed significantly on those, and so in October we were paying ninety nine dollars a ton. Another thing that complicates complicates recycling is uh, two things. First, the, um, uh, there's um, items in recycling stream that are not recyclable, mm -hmm. so it's called. Um, Contamination, I think they call that, and so that um, costs costs money to take it out. And the second is, of course, glass, which breaks. Right. And when glass with its single stream recycling breaks, it um, it, it causes a problem. So um, those are the two two items that are a drag on the, the, the cost here. And you know, before single stream recycling. So you, we used to get money, we used to get about 16 to $20 a ton back in recycling revenue. So just to give you an idea of that. The issue that we've dealt with when Betsy was around, uh, there was a removing of labels off of glass because... Right. Of, so yeah. um, we have a, a glass, um, it's, it's by volunteer only, 
Um, but we have a, a gla container that was given to a, we were, was no charge was provided to us where residents can go and dispose of glass. It's like a pilot program to see how it works, what kind of interest there is, what challenges there are, labels, food in the containers. So we're sort of working through all those um, those difficulties. And the goal here is ultimately to recycle glass and use it in building products. You can use it in certain concrete and other things. Um, but it's, it's not really there yet as a technology and as a process. So that's sort of the, the last that time I looked in that container, it, there were a lot of labels on the glass. It right. wasn't really. Yeah, the labels, I think well, the lead. You've got to put them in the sink and let hot yeah. water yeah. in. I have, yeah. I have a razor. It's, it's, so it's, it's, so it's dreadful. So glass is not as valuable because then it's got the paper and the glue. And the, mm. So, Tony, it is uh, diverting from our recycling, which costs us money, and glass is heavy. So right. are, we, are we seeing some not positive? Real, well, we've only had a couple of tons. We haven't really had a lot of volume yet. Maybe so. we need to get the word out a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, well, that's one of that's one of our list of. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's on the list. Right. <laughs> we'll get to it. Yeah, we'll get help. but we're yeah. we're not the you know so we're in a multi we're in a town a consortium with um, about twelve towns, fifteen towns, mm -hmm. most of Fairfield County towns, mm -hmm. Milford, um, Fairfield, Westport, so maybe Bridgeport. Maybe we could. In your monthly thing, we could talk about how we recycle glass and, or, or just some of those other initiatives. Yeah, somebody actually brought it up to me at a meeting and I said I would get to it. And I, uh, it's, I, but I can't add it to my monthly report. You know. Food waste is the other Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Food good. waste? Yeah. yeah. Didn't we put, we had, a, we had a brochure that talked about it at one point. We put it in the tax bills, but that's not true. It's all part of our sustainable. So right, we did it last two bronze. years ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we can certainly so get Tony, it out again. Uh, we're showing a shortfall of almost $200,000 in special education excess um, cost right. grant funds. The state of Connecticut had a huge surplus this year. I think it was $2 billion. I could be wrong on the number, but it was enormous. Right. Can't we tap into some of that money to help augment our cost for, or, or subsidize there, our there cost? There are many that have tried to, uh, <laughs> to do that, but so far have been not successful. Keep pushing. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tony, I had a question about the opioid settlement funds. Mm -hmm. Do we are we required to direct that money towards anything? So it's supposed to be a reimbursement of costs that you incurred as a result of the opioid crisis. Sure. That doesn't mean you can't direct them to mm -hmm. other uses or other things that you've you know, or maybe programs a treatment program yeah. or to buy Human equipment. I, I had a discussion with uh, Human Services okay. about this. So okay. I think they're putting together a proposal to oh, that'd be great. possibly use some of those mm -hmm. funds. Because it makes sense to use that money to yeah. try to prevent it does, future yeah. issues. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the last item is uh, the failed, uh, the Amity, um, we would be contributing $134,000 less to Amity this year because we budgeted higher than where they actually wound up as a contribution from the town. Great. Did we get any news from they were meeting Monday night and I haven't actually acting? I asked I and I known. lost track of time. Okay. So I we'll wait and see. I'm sure we'll they'll let us see. know. <laughs> uh, very good. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments on that monthly report? Okay, hearing none. Item B is funding requests. Action is appropriate. And we'll start with the first one, which is I hope my book is correct. Light item transfer number 2223-13 of $131,000. Request from the Board of Ed to transfer tuition revenue from the New Haven Board of Ed for student-specific costs at Beecher Road. And uh, I, I guess to get it rolling, I'll move acceptance of that light item transfer. Is there a second? Second. Second. Thank you. Um, and with that, Tony, maybe you want to talk a little bit further. And there's, a, there's a memo in your packet from Christina. Christine Syriac about that a new student enrolled in the district with an out of district placement. Right. Addition, the district was required to add an unbudgeted bus at the start of the 2023 school year for specific education due to registration of new students in August of 2020. So the receipt of the funds, the reason why we received the funds, there's no direct relationship between that and the expenditures that they're incurring this right. year. It's just they're available, they were. Um, for expenditures they had last year that they had to absorb in their budget because 
the money didn't come in in time from New Haven. So, you know, they would have returned, you know, that to us if they hadn't you know, had to cover that. But I just wanted to make that point. So I had a couple of questions about this. Um, so their request, their cover letter requesting doesn't say what their actual costs are. They're just matching the dollar amount they know we received. Is that mm -hmm. what's happening there? Yeah, so we received, we have a little more. We received 142, I think it is. Okay, so they're asking total. for 131 of that. And, and that dollar amount is to cover costs that they don't currently have in their budget or expenditures that they're going to need to make that they don't currently have funding for. But it doesn't, um, that when you talked earlier about having a, a shortfall in what the state was reimbursing us, right? those are not matching up, right? So, so we still have that shortfall in addition to additional costs. Correct. And then this one piece of revenue that does not make up for both of those. That's things. correct. So typically when we get requests like this, we, we ask our requesting agencies and the departments to hold off until we know what our experience of winter is going to be before we, we make allocations. But this is coming out of contingency. Well, it would go into the money that, that is coming in from the city of New Haven would go into our contingency? It would, it would, it would, it would happen is if, if for some reason it didn't get used, it would just go into fund balance right, at, at the, the end. end of the year and essentially reimburse the town for the expenditures that were made yet last year. Right. So there's no real difference in sending it to them now versus waiting because we, I mean, we could use it for another purpose. Could. If, if we have an extraordinarily bad winter. You could. Um, but it, it, I just, I'm not seeing much detail in the way of what their expenditures are now that they're asking us for the funding for. And usually there's like line items, and I don't know if we got that information. So. We didn't, we just received this letter. Right. Yeah, I wish they were still here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, to answer. Well, any other comments? No. So the process would be if we, if we say yes to this, yeah. then it goes to the Board of Finance. Right. Perhaps they can get the, the information. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We can do that. Okay, sure. Can we call the question? Tomorrow night. Sure. Unless let, I just want to make sure no one has any other comments. But okay. Hearing none, I will call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next item is a request for funding number 2223-14 in the amount of $4,108 uh, for a Replacement of a UPS, it's not, it's which not is a delivery service. Oh, no. Uninterrupted so, power so, supply. What is a uninterrupted power Un supply, power supply. <laughs> <laughs> at the fire station? I guess yep. it's reached its uh, it's in jeopardy of imminent demise, right. and uh, it says failure here by, instead of demise. But there was some kind of a problem. It's reached its end of useful life. I was told. So with that, I'll motion approval of that. Is there a second? Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions on this? What, what kind of UPS? What kind of it's what? It's for our, um, our, our, ser our servers and the fire department servers and a bunch of other uh, computerized, sensitive computerized equipment. So it handles, I guess, the whole server? Correct. Yeah. That's right. You and know a bunch all of that other, stuff. A bunch of other <laughs> items. <laughs> it's you a rather have large to ask what a UPS is. And it's some other equipment they have there that they have the fire department. Radio equipment and such. The giant battery, basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, basically. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Hearing none, I'll call the question. All in favor, signify by saying uh, aye. 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 Thank you very much. Next one is. We have to do it, but anyway. Line item transfer number 2223 15, the amount of $5,500. We have a grant for almost $600,000 for our town center sidewalk and pedestrian safety improvements. And I guess SHPO has decided, or they've told us, but before we go forward, they require an archeological historical <laughs> material study. I know. So I'm just not gonna comment. I'm just putting it out there. And I'll make a motion that we approve this. The money is coming from cancellation of other prior PO, so at least it's not coming as out of contingency. As much as I hate to do it, I'm not going to make a comment either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to go forward with this. You know, I don't get, get to keep done. anything. Oh so I'll make a motion approval of that motion. Is there a second? Okay. Thanks, Joe. 
Any uh, any comments or just call the question, <laughs> right, David? <laughs> All in favor, signify signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. And. I think we're up to, is that all the funding requests? That's Tony? it. Okay. Uh, next item is the gasoline and diesel yeah, authorized the first selectman and administrative officer and director of finance to lock in the price. Thank so um, every year the town, along with um, uh, Amity and the uh, town of Orange and uh, Region 16, I think it is, in Prospect, Bethany, and... Um, Boards of Ed of each town uh, enter into a fuel consortium. We're in a fuel consortium. We do a fuel bid, and um, so we're we've all decided that we are still going to um, go out to bid on uh, Monday for pricing for gas and diesel. We just use gas and diesel. We also do heating oil for those uh, facilities that still have heating oil, and um, we'll see where the prices come in and lock in the pricing. I think that's the general idea. Same concept as the gas, right? Locking in the pricing here as opposed to floating on the market. Mm -hmm. That's the question here. So the consortium is pretty much as a whole has decided we should probably lock in. Right. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so do we have to make a motion to do well, that? Well, you have to offer, because we the to price floats. Okay. We Someone else should make that We motion. have one hour basically <laughs> to decide. I don't want to and then the price will change. <laughs> I'll make a motion to authorize the first selectman to. And the town administrative officer, director of finance. Yep. Okay, to do so. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any other discussion, comments, questions? No, I, I, I think that it's probably a wise move because we're probably going to be supplying a lot of Europe with gas this right. winter. Right. Yeah. I think you're correct. It's yeah. going to push I the agree. price up. Yeah. So, yeah, if we can lock in, yeah. I think we'd be yeah. advantageous. Okay. With that, I'll call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition or extensions? No. I'll, I'll give you an example of locking in. Um, so, our electricity generation price right now is about 7.8 cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, we're locked in through next. Um, October of 2024. Mm -hmm. So, have you seen what has been going on with yeah. electricity? Yep. That's a benefit of locking in your rate. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just thought I'd share that. Good work. Yeah. Beth, can you or Tony? I, I apologize to go back, but is the SHPO thing come with these grants from the state? Is that why we have to do it? Correct. So, they're basically, they hold a gun to your head and that's correct. Well it's done, more like state. a Nerf gun, but it's still <laughs> uh, you know, something that we have to do. Yep. We, give it to we didn't know about it. it just, this requirement you know, of, yeah. you know, it just but, comes. Okay. And digging, I, I have, this is the first time I've dealt with that as far as a, a grant. I don't know if I've had, we ever had another one. If, if we don't do it and, and we hit something. Archaeological. Yeah. Pour the concrete right I'll on top of the arrowheads. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll give you an example. The, for each grant we get, we have to send in a one-page information sheet. Then they'll determine whether they need to do anything. The senior center, for example, they did not because it's inside. It's the age of the facility, the use, et cetera, et cetera. They did not get involved in that project. Go but for every grant we receive, I have to fill out information on uh, what the project is and stuff. Once again, I will no comment. <laughs> Somebody's cousin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Just, just um, information. Thank you. Item D is lease financing from the fire department, air packs, and radios. Um, you have in your. Maybe, Tony, you want to explain this a little sure. bit better. So uh, at their last meeting, <laughs> you, you uh, approved the purchase of air packs and radios as presented by the fire chief. So uh, I went out to uh, get pricing on leasing those uh, the equipment and um, I received several quotes. And the lowest was J.P. Morgan with a rate of 4.87%. That might change slightly based on the increase in the rate just recently. So um, this I price it at the time of when I get the pricing because the rates could change a little, but they were the by far the lowest. Uh, the next highest one was uh, five point 
above 5%, 5.2. So um, that would be my recommendation. So that 4.8% is locked in for us? Well, it'll be, it'll be approximately, as soon as I fill out the paperwork, yes, we'll lock that right in. That's a great rate. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Any comments or questions on this? Better than putting it on the credit card. <laughs> no, you don't do that. <laughs> okay, with that, um, I will make a motion that we award the lease for the air packs and radios for the fire department <coughs> leasing, um, leasing for the fire department to J.P. Morgan, as discussed in the memo. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And it's unanimous. Thank you. And lastly, Tony wants to give us an update, which is good, on investment. So, um... We have uh, basically two types of investments here in town. We have uh, investments that are um, un under a trust agreement, or basically, uh, which would be our um, other post-employment benefits. And we have, uh, there's three of them. There's uh, a trust for Noise D. Clark, which is funds for the library. And there's a, a trust document for the Common Investment Fund, which is the town cemetery. So those three items are uh, in tr under trust and are invested by the investment committee. All of our regular funds, all, all of our other funds, are highly regulated by the state, and um, <clears throat> we can only invest in a limited number of things, like um, there's a state um, investment fund they have. It's called the STIF, Short-Term Investment Fund. Uh, we can invest in, you know, obligations of the state of Connecticut or, you know, treasuries, U.S. agencies, you know, very safe. <coughs> and one thing that we um, can invest in our certificates of deposit, which we haven't done uh, many years because it locks your money in for a longer period of time. But um, our, our rates have been... Below one percent. I wrote them down there. Um, so our rates haven't been up above four percent. Right now, it's about four point, a little over four percent. Depends on what you get, but um, hasn't been over four percent since two thousand and eight, mm. and hasn't been over two. What hasn't been over one percent since March of twenty twenty, which is right when COVID. So it's interesting. You can see what happened in the in the and in in, in how it resulted in change in rates um, I think we were above 1% for a while 2% for a while um, so now we're at 4% and rates seem to be going up which is typically a good time to lock into CDs so um, I just wanted to mention that see we in uh, it's a it's a process I thought you find it interesting they're called CD ladders I don't know if everyone has ever heard of them yeah so that's what typically what we do so you invest in a number of CDs so that the principal plus interest is lower than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so that you can your um, money is secure and you don't have any risk of losing your principal uh, payment. So we'll probably do that. I just thought I'd mention that to you. Why CDs and not long-term treasuries? We could. We can look at those also. Which is CD. We get we get pricing on them. How, and see how which far out is your CD ladder? Um, so I, I haven't put it together completely, but I would, you know, I tend to be more conservative than, you know, I, want to, I don't want, I want to, don't want to tie up our money too long a period of time, so probably a year or two, you know, in different increments, six months, a year, eight, you know, right, but 18 a, months. But a ladder goes out over a, you know, a, per, probably two a years. period of time, two years yeah. total? Yeah. 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 Think interest rates are going to stay up? Uh, well, that's the question. That's what we have to. I actually haven't acted on it yet because I wanted to see what happened today, okay. and then you need to get more. Yeah, it sounds like for the next. One up half a point today. For the next yeah, year, half it's a point, right? So, I mean, if we think the interest rates are only going to go up for the next year, maybe we just lock them in for a year. I think for the next year, it looks like it's going to be going up. Yeah, I think we're pretty safe on that. So, anyway, just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's helpful. Anybody have any other comments or questions on that? Do you have an other other? No, I do not. Okay, thank you. Item eight is the consent agenda. Um, 
which includes the 2023 meeting dates, the tax refunds, and tax I will refunds. tell you that there are no tax refunds this month. Thank you. Okay. Uh, minutes um, and town clerk's report. So I will motion that we approve the all the items. Is there a second? I have an item on the agenda. <coughs> I'm not on the agenda, on the minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, go for it. Let me find it. <laughs> okay, so on page four, uh, discussion ensued about the fact that there were no additional funds in the town's budget for the restoration work on the um, uh, on the Darling Darling House property. Uh, there was a discussion about possibly getting some money from the contingency fund. I'd like that added to the minutes. I don't remember, but the discussion. I asked Tony that question. Okay. Said it yes. was possible. That he wouldn't, didn't want to do it, but it was possible. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like okay. to have it added to the minutes, please. Okay. So I Thank think we you. need to remove the minutes from the consent agenda and then vote separately with okay. an amendment. Okay. Fine. So we will vote so a on a friendly amendment to remove I minutes from the previous motion. Thank you. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And now we vote on the consent agenda minus the minutes A, B, and D. Well, if, oh, we have to do a motion. I'll make a motion. To, oh, we did we motion already? We did? Yeah, we motion. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so A, B, and D. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Actually, B, that we there's don't have no to vote. There's no tax refund, so we don't, we'll just do A and D. Okay, thank you. And then uh, now we have to make a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes uh, with the suggested changes from Dr. Lober. Is there a second? Second. Oh, I can't second it. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, that's great. And now we move on to item nine, which is a uh, report of the personnel committee. I just got to get to it, sorry. Just item nine. So the personnel committee uh, had, which is a sub, met yesterday at uh, December 13th, and present was me and Selectman Curie Coast and Selectman uh, Lover. And uh, the first item on our agenda was to discuss, if you recall, um, oh, let's see, the commission's request, the library commission had requested um, in, I believe, in June of 2022 to raise the um, library director salary by ten thousand dollars correct and at that time the personnel committee agreed to um, approve and it was I believe approved by the board of selectmen at a subsequent meeting uh, to approve a five thousand dollar raise with the stipulation that once there was a chairman of the library commission they come back at the next personnel committee meeting so with that, um, we had a discussion with Chairman, now now Library Commission Chair Tom Chernow, and after discussion, given the fact that um, there's money in the budget to do this, correct, David? Right. It was a good question you asked the other day that we continue and give um, Eric this the extra five thousand. So the committee voted unanimously to do this, um, to give um, a library director receive a five thousand dollar increase in his annual salary, and. Um, I guess at this point we have to ask the board of selectmen to approve that. So I will make a motion that we approve um, that the library director Worthman, Worthman receive a five thousand dollar increase in his annual salary. And I need a second. second. Thank you. And I just want to before we do that, we have to ask: Are there any comments or questions? We we had a good, robust discussion that he does a fabulous job, and the library sustained us a lot in the uh, COVID. So with that, hearing nothing, I'll call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Thank you. And then um, the next item that we discussed was the assistant administrative officer's position. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about the history and how we got here, Tony. Okay. As personnel Would director. Like to do and that? Then, yep. Yeah. And I'll. Okay. So um, Betsy uh, left in uh, August. We put. Um, uh, a, a job at a notice out and um, we uh, were, were pretty aggressive about uh, trying to advertise a position in def different areas and um, received not very many applications so there wasn't a high level of interest in this position and um, of the applications we received 
uh, there were a few internal candidates and, um, and some external candidates and a, a few candidates actually uh, withdrew their applications after we discussed the uh, responsibilities of the position and the time commitments of the position and so um, in the meantime um, you know one of the um, interested candidates was um, Karen Crosby you all know Karen you know Karen yeah. and uh, she has been sort of filling in doing a lot of those roles um, just uh, because that's who Karen is she when if there, we have something to do she will um, will do it and um, so she is our selection for the assistant administrative officer position and um, I think she'll do a great job she's been basically doing a lot of these um, throughout the years uh, anyway and she helps Beth and I with a lot of our tasks and Exactly. That's basically the story. Yeah, it's, it's so wonderful because as Tony mentioned, um, normally for these we get lots of applicants and there were a total mm -hmm. of five, I believe. Five, correct. And two of them were not qualified to, and then the other two that heard that were not, you know, when, once they found out it was nights and weekends and staffing and <laughs> just uh, kind of withdrew them. Right. There, so we were really, we've been suffering terribly and Karen sort of stood out as someone that could really do this. and. Uh, She's We're been, very excited. She's, as Tony said, she's, she's been, been really an stepping up. For, she's been here since I've been here. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So she knows the town very right. well. Mm -hmm. So it was a unanimous decision of the personnel committee to um, recommend to the board of selectmen that Karen Crosby be offered the position of assistant administrative <coughs> officer, including the duties of budget analyst. She's going to keep that. She's going to keep her budget responsibilities. Which will help. Correct. Right. Which and then that will the open transition. up a couple of other. So then her position will open, which is um, which is mainly uh, payroll, and uh, she does some finance, some payroll, and benefits administration. So we'll have to fill that position. Does she do the town website too? She do, yep, she do the town website. And grant writing. Grant writing. Yep, she's already gone to Projects. Of course, mm -hmm. yep, so. Plenty of work. So. Oh, <laughs> yes. So anyway, and the um, salary will be a salary of $95,000 per year. So that was a unanimous decision of the personnel committee. So Worth every penny. would you like to make this motion? What's that? I'll make the motion, yes. That we um, take the recommendation. That we take a recommendation and we uh, hire Karen Crosby to fill the position of assistant administrative officer at a salary of $95,000. Yeah, yeah. Starting so second? when? Going second. Starting when? Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. Okay. Wait, eight thirty tonight. All right. I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank Any you other sure. questions or discussions? Thirteen minutes. Okay. You said what? Thirteen minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'll call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that takes care of that. Um, we have uh, item 10 is an appointment. There was a vacancy on an alternate for town plan and zoning. Uh, Susan Cassidy resigned, and we now have someone to uh, step up. We have, is there, are there any nominations? I'd like to nominate Aaron Hoffman for the position okay, as alternate on TP and Z. And his CV is in the packet. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Any, do you have a nomination, David? Yes, I would like to nominate Joe Dye, former mm -hmm. Board of Selectmen member, for the position. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you. I'll call the nomination of Aaron Hoffman. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Opposed. Are there any abstentions? Are you going to abstain? No, I'm going to vote no. Okay. Yeah. All right. I was waiting. Okay. Thank you. So that position is filled four to two. Thank you. Um, next, we move on to item 11, which is town council's report. So my report consists of our executive session and <coughs> the att our attorney in the open communities lawsuit. He told me that he was uh, his expected time of arrival was 657. Oh. So he should be here any second, but I would suggest that we go into an executive session okay. now, and when he arrives, he can come in, and we can okay. indicate that he will be part of the executive session. Okay. So with that, I will make a motion that we go into executive session. 
um, for a discussion of pending litigation pursuant to Section 1-206B regarding Open Communities Trust LLC at Al versus Woodbridge Town Plan and Zoning Commission at Al, and also discussion of preliminary draft RFP for Woodbridge Country Club of Woodbridge. Wait a minute. Draft RFP for Country Club of Woodbridge pursuant to Section 1-206E and 1-210B1. And invite into executive session Attorney Weiner, um, Tony Genovese, and also Attorney, is it Tom Gerard? Okay, we're, 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 we're ready for you whenever you get here. <laughs> Great, right. I'm making a motion and it. I invited you and Tony and Tom. Is it Attorney Thomas Gerard? I, I think it's right? Thomas Gerard, yeah. Okay. He's six minutes away. He got rerouted for some reason. Then <laughs> when he got off the Merrick Parkway, he said so. Okay. <laughs> so with that, I will call the motion. Uh, I need a second. Sorry. Second. Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Um, <clears throat> would it be best to wait for the attorney to come, or is there well, No, something we can, you we can go into it, so we can sort of lay the groundwork of what we're here for, okay. and then he can come in. He can stop. Okay, so with that, I'll call the question. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. All right. I'll wait for the cameras to turn off. I'm going to.